This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. The split over whether to continue or cancel the Tokyo 2020 Summer Olympics continued this week with an online petition against the event garnering more than 350,000 signatures. This comes as top African athletes continue their preparations for the Games. Tonight's sports scene discusses the latest developments in the countdown to the Olympics as our Sportlight segment returns with Kenyan distance running star Jeffrey Kipsang Kamwaror. Hello and welcome to your home of African sports stories from the continent and beyond. This is Sports Scene on CGTN. I'm Mahe Mutua in Nairobi. Also coming up. In our special segment, Sportlight, we interview Kenya's world champion and record holder, Jeffrey Kips Kipsang Kamoror. And Nigerian football analysts split over Enyimba's chances in the CAF Confederations Cup. Let's begin with athletics. All eyes will be on Wade Van Niekerk when the South African returns to the Olympics to defend his title. His remarkable record-breaking feat at Rio 2016 captured global headlines. And now the question is whether or not the track star can hold on to his title. CGTN CS Duplessis reports. Wade Van Niekerk heads to the Olympic Games in Tokyo, a man on a mission. His objective is clear, and despite suffering a potentially career-ending knee injury, the 400-meter king is back on track and raring to go. I think every journey, even before the injuries, there was a few uh, doubts and fears that creeped in, but um, I'm trying to be uh, as, as resilient as possible and trying to just push through every challenge that I get. The more I get to expose my body and my, my mentality to, to the challenges and the obstacles, then I guess I'd end up being able to handle it better. He wants to obviously defend his title, but he really wants to go and run under 43. And like he said to me, he said to me when we had the discussion, now after all the rehab was done and we got the go ahead, he's healthy and he can train and run. If it wasn't 4303, so close to 42, it wouldn't have bothered him that much, but he knows it's there. It's, it's, it's within him that he can go and he can do it. Bunny Kerk, who recently split from his coach Tani Ants, is still determined to breach the one lap barrier he smashed in 2016. Nothing else. Um, sub 43 is my only goal. I mean, that's growth. I want to grow. I want to be the best all round athlete that's ever ran that I can feel. And uh, I still feel very determined and motivated, motivated to uh, continue that. But there are naysayers that believe the Olympic champion won't be able to emulate his performance in Rio. His longtime manager disagrees. He's intelligent. He's smart. He knows. He knows what his body can do and what what he needs to do. So, uh, I'm I'm quietly confident. I mean, he will also never make big statements and comments. And I share that view. But I'm quietly confident that he's gonna he's gonna be tough to beat. I mean, winning is something that that we want to do. I've I've tasted I've tasted it once, and and I would obviously love to continue it. So that's the only mentality that I do have. For the Olympic Games and, and obviously I also need to be realistic that it's not going to be easy so I'm doing whatever it takes to be ready and be at, at my utmost best to compete against the world's best but I'm, I'm definitely not going there to lose. Until the 400 meter Olympic champion delivers another stellar performance there will be critics who doubt that Fanny Kak isn't capable of reaching the heights of 2016 but before that famous final in Rio almost five years ago now not many besides his coach and himself expected the fireworks he would produce from lane eight and now the stage is set in Tokyo to prove his doubt is wrong yet again. CS2 plus C, CGTN, Pretoria. Now, Uganda has emerged as a dominant force in distance running and the resumption of athletics in the country is helping identify more running talent. With the Tokyo Games fast approaching, the East African nation could land their biggest medal haul in Olympics history, as CGTN's Leon Senyange now reports. Off to yet another race. It's been a long wait for many of these athletes to get back on track. For this Masieko, the time out since the suspension of sports due to the COVID-19 pandemic last year has greatly affected his running rhythm. He now hopes to make the most of the time ahead. 
Yeko is billed as a future prospect in the 5,000 meters. And he already has his eyes on big things, the Olympics later this year. Olympic qualification is still open until the end of June. But with a few weeks to the deadline, the coaches here admit there is still a lot of work to do to get the athletes in top form. The local athletics federation has held three competitions since resumption last February. While there have been some impressive results, a few seconds off could get the runners into qualification times. The long distance has been great. Uh, we've, we followed up the events that have happened from uh, the cross country that was in Tororo. I think that was a great performance. These are young guys that came up without our key stars and they ran 29 minutes in the 10 kilometer cross country, which showed they are superb, they are good to go. Uganda has already qualified more than 10 runners for the Olympics. Another addition in the long distance races could provide a study lineup that already includes world champions in Joshua Chapter Gay and Jacob Kiplimo. I believe our aspects in the long distance are going to be great. I know we'll get some good medals. You never know, come the days when we can be able to predict, but for now, I know we have the best in the world. Uganda is shaking up the long distance races, taking top positions in competitions that used to be dominated by Kenya and Ethiopia. There could be more to hope for even from runners like Yeko, who are yet to hit the big stage. Leon Sanyanga Sijitian, Kampala, Uganda. Well, the Tokyo 2020 organizing committee boss Seiko Hashimoto has said she takes the opinions of people who oppose the Olympics seriously. An online petition calling for the Games to be cancelled has been submitted with more than 350,000 signatures. The petition comes with Tokyo, Osaka and several other areas currently under a state of emergency with coronavirus infections rising. I'm aware that there were 350,000 online petitions against the Olympics. Many people have strongly expressed such opinions about whether it is possible to hold Tokyo in such a situation and what meaning it holds, so I take it seriously. Meanwhile, World Athletics President Seb Ko says his recent experiences in Japan have convinced him the Tokyo Olympics can go ahead safely. Ko was in both Tokyo and Sapporo for test events last week and was impressed with procedures in place to protect those taking part. I genuinely believe it can be delivered safely and securely. There are no perfect solutions uh, and there will be big, big challenges. But my, my real view from having been uh, in Tokyo and in Sapporo is that these protocols are very serious and you know we were hermetically sealed from you know from people you know outside of the hotel so look I, I think in, in micro I've seen really how seriously they take it the athletes that I spoke to that were out there both in the test and the test events on the track and on the roads recognized it was you know it, there were frustrations, but I think they were also comforted by the fact that the, the Japanese organizing committee were taking it as seriously as they did. Well, to discuss more on the Summer Olympics, we're now joined by Professor Habib Nurbai, who is an associate professor at the University of Johannesburg. He also contributes his time as a sports scientist and speaker and humanitarian. He joins us via Zoom from Johannesburg. Professor, what effect does the pandemic and subsequent lockdowns have on sportsmen and women's training uh, and preparations for the Olympics? Good evening, sir, and thanks for having me. Well, the effects is quite large. It's quite devastating, to be quite honest. And what the viewers need to understand is that athletes and coaches don't just prepare for Olympics over a span of one or two years. Some of them have even taken more than four years or more than six years to actually come to a pinnacle of this milestone. And one of the things that we talk about in sports science is periodization, where they've set different cycles, whether it's at meso cycles or macro cycles, smaller goals that lead up to a bigger goal at such an event. And such a hallmark event put so much of expectations on players and on coaches and on athletes in order to really perform well. So it has devastating effects, not only on the athlete's preparation, but as well as in terms of preparations as well and the performance optimization during that period. My concern though, especially coming from an African perspective is that this COVID-19 pandemic has placed such a huge 
burden in terms of inequality. We're talking about COVID-19 being nationalized or even inequality in terms of COVID-19 health and prevention. But there's also inequality that exists within different athletes around the world. We're finding that some athletes, despite COVID-19, and by adhering to physical distancing measures, they are still able to train and to prepare based on different types of structures and training facilities that they have. When you go into other types of countries, the resources might not be the same. So we are actually facing a huge inequality equilibrium. And at the same time, it's placing a huge toll on the preparation and the training effects on athletes uh, leading up to such a hallmark event. And Professor, still on that subject, it seems that organizers and leading figures in sport, such as the World Athletics President Seb Ko, uh, seem to be sending mixed messages on Tokyo 2020. How does this then affect athletes preparing for the Games? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's certainly debilitating because do you put your foot on the pedal or take it off? Um, I mean, there's one thing that comes into preparation and that's tapering. So do you really prepare and look forward towards a certain goal? And then with the event of it not coming, for example, for many years in within this decade, people and athletes have actually been preparing for the Olympics to take place last year. And when this pandemic struck, it has really put them onto the back burner. So even now with the possible postponement talks, it now at the same time leaves athletes and coaches within a situation of whether they carry on with their periodization plans, with their training programs, with their different preparations, logistics. I mean, there's so much that goes into preparing for such an event and for, I mean, this is the Olympics. So there's so much that goes into place there. So, but the other thing that's really a concern as well is, again, from this instance, how do we measure the concepts of business versus health. The public in Japan probably want to protect the health of their people because such hallmark events bring in many people in terms of spectators and different stakeholders. So do we protect the health of people from this virus potentially surging with different waves coming in, with different variants that are being introduced? Or do we safeguard the business of the Olympics and the organizers as well as the athletes and coaches who are training to compete at this uh, prestige stage. So it's a tough one to balance, but I'm always of the opinion scientifically to put health first, because although it's going to really put economical burdens on those involved with the Olympics, at the same time, we really need to try our utmost best to curb this pandemic in which this virus is still at its nascent stage and there is still a lot that we do not know about. All right, Professor, thank you very much for your insights. Professor Habib Nurbai, Associate Professor at the University of Joburg, joining us live from Joburg. It's time for us to take a short break. Here's what's coming up on Sports Scene. On our Sportlight interview, we speak with Kenya's world champion and record holder Jeffrey Kipsang Kamoror. How would you create your legend? On the field on the tracks, in the arenas of Africa. Were you born to be a player? Could this moment be yours? Sports scene, find your game. Now, Jeffrey Kipsang Kamoror is one of Kenya's shining lights in long distance running. The three time world half marathon and world cross, cha cross champion is hailed as one of the most versatile athletes with medals on the track, cross country, and road. The record holder and training partner to marathon great Eliud Kipchoge sits down with us this week on Sportlight. It's a pleasure this afternoon to be joined by Jeffrey Kamoror here on CGTN Sports. Jeffrey, thank you for joining us. Welcome. Now, let me take you back to 2011. That was when you first won your, you won your first title in Punta Umbria, uh, just a few hours after landing. Uh, just take us through what that was about. How important was that performance for you? Uh, I think uh, when I won uh, my first club title in 2011, I think uh, I, I had only one and a half years after finishing my high school, I was still new in, uh, in sports. And it, it, meant a it meant a lot to me. 
uh, because I saw that uh, I saw a great talent in, in me. It gave me a lot of motivation. I, I get to believe so much on myself. And from then, I've been uh, doing great in uh, whatever the competitions I've done. It really motivated me. Now, Jeffrey, you're known as somebody who can, you can compete ev everywhere, all, all types of terrain, uh, uh, both uh, surface, track, cross, and roads. How are you able to do that? Where, where, where does that come from, the, the, the fact that you're, you're so adaptable to all these different types of terrain? Mm, first of all, I can say that uh, I have a great coach who is uh, Patrick Sa, he was himself an athlete mm -hmm. and he plans well, he knows well about uh, athletics and whatever we plan with him, he, he knows the, prog uh, the program that suits very well with the, the event at that time and most importantly is the self-belief and uh, planning because when we plan uh, something, we, f we, we focus on it and for me actually I always uh, believe so much that I can do it. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I always don't uh, limit myself, the way Elut has put that, no human is limited. So I, I don't count myself that I'm running a marathon, I cannot uh, do a cross country. Mm -hmm. So to me, I, I cannot limit myself in, any t in, in whatever the, the service. You've run in many cities all over the world. Uh, maybe just tell us which one city caught your eye, which one really impressed you, uh, where you enjoyed running uh, the streets there. Actually, I can say it's a New York City Marathon yeah. because I've run there four times and I've won twice. I've been second once and third uh, once. So it's uh, the, the, whole, uh, the whole times I've run there, is, uh, I've always been in podium mm -hmm. and it has been a great race for me. Now, let me take you back to maybe a dark moment in your, in your career. Where in, back in 2016, you had a very, very serious fall. But after that, you came back to be two-time world half marathon champion. Where, where do you get the strength to come back from something like that? I think uh, many people were in, involved, like my family, they, they gave me a lot of support, they encouraged me so much that you'll be okay. Uh, my, uh, my, uh, my coach was always telling me, take your time, you'll be okay, you'll come back. My training mates were telling me, we miss you so much, come again, uh, you are okay, stop staying at home, you are okay. So they were encouraging me so much, the management. They were telling me that, uh, remember next year there is a world championship and you need to be there, so don't worry, you will be okay. Okay, now there's only two other athletes who have won uh, the World Cross, World Half and 10,000 meter medals. That is Paul Tergat and Paula Radcliffe. How does it make you feel to be in such such great company, co company as those two runners? It makes me feel great and uh, motivated mm -hmm. because when I'm amongst them, you are amongst the great. And of course, it motivates you to be uh, more greater than, than where they reach. I, and for sure, I can say that uh, I could have broken uh, many limits when, when we go back to the, when they used to hold the World Cross Country yearly, annually, I mean. One thing you've been very vocal about, you've, you've, you've really stressed the importance for the rights of athletes. Uh, it's, it's something that I think is, is very passionate for you. Why is that and uh, is, is Kenya doing enough to, to protect the welfare and the rights of athletes? It comes because you are, you are passionate about athletics first and secondly you are proud about your country and uh, when you represent your country and winning a medal, running around with your, with your uh, maybe Kenyan flag, you, you feel so proud, you are like you are carrying the whole country and you feel that you, yeah, it gives you a lot of uh, motivation. It's a, been a, a great honor and we'll be watching you in Tokyo 2020 and, and your steps along the way as well. Well, here's what's still to come on Sports Scene. Nigerian football analysts split over Enyimba's chances in the CAF Confederations Cup.
Welcome back. Let's quickly run you through the upcoming fixtures in the CAF Confederations Cup as the tournament enters its quarterfinal stage. All eight teams are in action on Sunday with Nigeria's Enyimba Football Club set to face Egyptian side Pyramids in their first leg in Cairo with the second leg a week later on May the 23rd. South Africa's Orlando Pirates are at home to Raja Casablanca in Johannesburg. Kabili of Algeria make the trip to Sfax to take on CS Sfaxien while Coton Sport of Cameroon hosts Senegal's Jaraf in Garua. Enyimba are aiming to become the first Nigerian team to win the tournament and analysts there are divided over their chances against the favourites pyramids. You know, you're as good as your last game. When you go by the statistics for me, I think it doesn't favour Enyimba, but um, there might be a different spirit, there might be a turnaround, the coaching crew might rejig that team and Maybe we're able to pull fire out of the chestnut for against that game. Um, if they qualify or if they are able to beat Pyramid, it will be a surprise for me. I don't believe that uh, they will just fight against Pyramid. Um, I mean, the best Nigerian team uh, by a mile on the continent, champions in the CAF, uh, in CAF competitions uh, back in 2003, 2004, when they won the CAF Champions League. And they've been in and about um, the last eight in, in cup competition. So um, I fancy their chances. The Pyramid, yes, a big team. is a team that is rich, that can buy players from around the continent, indeed around the world. But Eiba, um, the only hope for the Nigerian uh, team on the continent, I see them giving, a, giving the fight. Now, unrest in South Sudan may have prevented the country's running talent from flourishing, but that has not stopped ambitious athletes from pursuing their dreams. Some are now living and studying in neighboring Uganda to further their ambitions. The CGTN's Leon Senyange now reports. Daniel Santino has been running here for the last three years. The university student is one of a dozen South Sudanese athletes taking part in Uganda's athletics competitions. Most of the time, people, when they hear about South Sudan, they say that maybe it's full of hostile people and so on. But I'm trying to disapprove them, trying to tell them that we are capable of doing other things. Santino's performances have been impressive, and that has got him thinking big. My aim is not to stop running until I reach to the Olympic and win a gold medal. The national trials gather the country's best to compete in different race categories. Back home, the lack of proper running facilities hold athletes like Santino back. The athletes say the competitions here have helped them improve. There have been breakthroughs with some qualifying for international events. Abraham Chuot will represent South Sudan at the 2021 World Junior Athletics Championships in Kenya. He will be competing in the 800 meters. 800 meters is not easy. Because I'm like exactly Kenyan, they are tough, so I have to train hard. They, um, the more they train, also the more I train. And with every championship, the South Sudanese athletes have shown remarkable progress. The desire is to see many more on the track. Without any progress, some of our athletes could have not made that uh, qualifying time and some could have not been near to the qualification time. So there is very good progress which is going on and indeed we will, if we will continue like this, I hope people will hear us in short time. Success may not be too far for these runners. A couple of race victories have raised their status. With the possibility of numbers growing, South Sudan could soon be the next athletics powerhouse in East Africa. Leon Senenga CGTN, Kampala. Gander. Finally, aspiring Olympians are working a lot harder to achieve their dreams amid the pandemic. COVID-19 tore up the sporting calendar, leaving athletes training in, the back, in their backyards. Top-ranked South African figure skater Gian Quinn Isaacs has not let this deter her. She still has her eyes on, set on making the cut for next year's Winter Games in Beijing. CGTN's Julie Shire now reports. Four-time South African figure skating champion Jan Quinn Isaacs is confident and graceful on the ice. She tried on her skates when she was just seven and at 16 hopes to become the first South African since 1998 to compete in the Winter Olympics. For me, figure skating, it's the one place where I actually feel 
like myself. It's where I feel like I belong. It's taught me so much where I know it's okay to make mistakes and we can grow from those and we fall, that's how we learn. What it means to me is it's basically my, my home, away from home. Isaacs remained optimistic through the lockdown despite not being able to train or compete. Since getting back onto the ice, her focus has been on next year's Winter Games in Beijing. To be able to qualify for the Olympics, I think for anyone would be a proud moment, especially knowing that not many people have been able to qualify from South Africa as we aren't as recognized as other countries. So to be able to qualify, it would honestly mean the world to me. So if Jian keeps going in the direction that she's going and we stick to the plan that we have going forward, I think that Jian can really excel in the sport and she could qualify for the Olympics and represent South Africa at the Olympics one day. Um, she's definitely heading in that direction. The champion skater hopes her success will bring a voice to the sport, which is hugely underrated in South Africa. In South Africa, they call it a Cinderella sport. So it's frustrating because soccer and those things are recognized, figure skating isn't. So financially, it is quite difficult to fund skating. We have to do fundraisers. There are so many things that, as a figure skater, we have to sacrifice to keep the sport alive. Jian Quinn is hoping there will be an international competition that can enable her to qualify for the Winter Olympics and head to Beijing in 2022. Julie Shara, Sich Cape Town, South Africa. And that's it. Does it for this week's edition of Sports Scene. Thanks for watching. Do remember you can send your feedback to those contacts on your screen now and follow us on our digital media platforms. Amahe Mutua, thanks for watching. We'll leave you with our move of the week where four-time cliff diving World Series champion Rihanna Iflander became the first woman to successfully dive from a moving hot air balloon in New South Wales.